So I'm um, Kelly Hoey. I am the CMO of Curio. In my past life, I was a lawyer. I worked in places like this and worried about name tags and showing up on time. Um, so, and I didn't get to wear things like I get to wear now. So, ask me if I miss the law. Anyway. <laughs> So, okay, so uh, you've got all these, the other things we worry about in law firms, and then we seriously love Oric, done a bunch of events with them, awesome, awesome, and this is why we love doing things in the places like this, because you, yes, you had great food and wine, <laughs> the beer was cold, wasn't it? It wasn't warm, um, like most startup events, and uh, there was, you know, something other than cold pizza, so this is all good. You have nice green folders. This is the other reason we love law firms. They put things in the nice folders. And you have everyone's bios, so I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to tell you, we have an incredible first panel of uh, founders who have grown revenue, started companies, written best-selling books, won awards, conquered several continent cities with everything they've done. And you'd think they'd be smarter than starting another company. Ladies, please. <laughs> like, what? what have you done? So... Let's just, with this first panel, we're talking about the glamour. I don't know where we want to start with with the glamour. I'm going to go right to Kathy, right in the middle. I knew it. Because, yeah, like, you, know, you know, as a mom, your life is already so glamorous. I'm glad you brought that up because last night, my daughter was puking all over me and I, had, I was supposed to send a message to my board um, about something I needed approval for. Uh, couldn't do it because of the realities of my child throwing up all over me. So it was appropriate because I knew we were having this conversation today about the glamour. So immediately I thought how glamorous it is for me to be in this position right now uh, last night. <laughs> Had you been there, you would have felt the glamour coming from me. Um, and so I guess my question is about glamour. I, I'm in B2B. So I think just innately what I do isn't glamorous. I don't ever associate what I do for a living as glamorous because it's a B2B ad targeting company. I don't, you know, if you're in B2C, I can see the well, glamour. Well, if you're in enterprise tech, that for sure would be sexy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I question the glamour um, aspect of it. Just based on the product. Yeah, just based on, based on the idea that ad targeting could be sexy or glamorous. I mean, I think data is sexy, but I'm probably alone. Joy would like that, the fact that I think data is sexy. I love data. <laughs> But um, uh, not a lot of people do. So I think that I don't really feel that any, there's not a lot that I do that's glamorous. Yeah. But you, we were you talking that, about so this. Like, so oh. Alyssa? So, uh, you know, I was wandering around downstairs and, you know, you want to meet people. That's what you're here for. Yeah. I'll put the, pull, I'll put the mics right into you. Yeah, Hold on so it. I was, you know, walking around. Mine is not on. There we go. I was walking around downstairs and I saw Kathy from Local Response and I was so excited to meet you. I was so excited to meet Kathy because, you know, I'd heard of Local Response and I knew Kathy was on the panel. And I think that's part of the glamour. The glamour is, you know, you walk into a room and people are already so excited about you and about what you've built. Uh, and I think the other piece that feels glamorous is when you're you know, working your nine to five job, and I remember when I was in a cubicle at Everyday Health, which just IPO'd, but like 10 years ago, I first had my aspirations to be a founder because I saw just their, their lives and their jobs were so much cooler than mine. You know, like if I was five minutes late, like if I got there at 9.05, like people were yelling at me, you know, and I wanted just, I wanted all the freedom I wanted to be able to execute on my own ideas, my own ethics. So I think that's a lot of the glamour, regardless of product. Product is this like notion of escaping and like leading something. And, and it's just the part that's not glamorous to me is the flip side of like how, how hard, like all the awful things we have to do to get those like Good parts. Get the, get the good stuff. Like, Amanda. Yeah. Str strings attached. Just glamour. Strings attached. No, from um, Amanda coming from the glamorous world of journalism and food glamorous. and cookbooks and <laughs> like, very like high salaries in journalism. Oh yeah. yeah. Woo! I bet. I bet um, you're, you're just coasting on that. You know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. I sort of miss the little mouse that used to crawl by my desk at the New York Times. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
it's um, not glamorous at all. I have a food startup. Um, so, um, like, there's cooking happening in the kitchen all the, all the time in our office, which um, sounds kind of fun, but, like, I smell like a hamburger right now. Um, <laughs> and, um, and there's, you know, I just think that, like, the, I, I actually really um, love it. But, um, you know, we had this thing when we hire people, we said, like, like everyone... Um, Everyone washes dishes, um, and that's true. And um, you know, back when I did work in journalism, I didn't always have to wash the dishes because there were food stylists and there were you know um, other other people involved. And um, and so like you know, at our startup, like everyone changes the garbage and everyone does dishes. And um, and yeah, like it's like a real, it's like a tr <laughs> it's a true um, right. kind of like you know hands on um, experience. But I I actually really love it, um, and I wouldn't uh, trade it for anything in the world. Yeah, no, I think back in my old life, it's like, you know, the computer wasn't working. You called the IT department. I am my IT department, and that's really scary. Really, really scary. Kate? Um, oh, so we, my co-founder, Shayla, we've been bootstrapping a little bit until we um, have recently fundraised. Uh, but she was using dog vacay to kind of get income. And I remember on Valentine's Day this year, her dog, um, the dog that she was looking after actually peed on the mattress. So like, if you want to think about glamour, that's the, you know, absolute opposite of it. Um, I'm not that attracted to entrepreneurialism from the glamour side. Um, I'm from Australia, although I was born in England, so there's a hybrid accent. Um, and in Australia, it's a smaller place. So I, I found over time, it's easier. Um, Shayla sometimes jokes. I mean, this sounds really wrong, but it's like the Special Olympics in, in terms of founders because there's less of you, so you get promoted more. Um, but I don't know. But the thing Somebody is, better tweet that because that was really non-PC <laughs> no, and fabulous. Um, no, I know it's bad, but I, I, over time I just found that I had so many incoming like press requests, speaking requests and all of that stuff, and I think it's a massive distraction from actually building your business. And when I moved to New York, I absolutely like cut out a lot of like networking I cut out a lot of like meeting people. I know it's really important for raising and I'm so much happier now that I have all this time and I'm not getting like piles and piles of requests. I think if you're a, on the VC side or you're on the angel side, yes, you know, it's your job to kind of almost be out there and help people. But um, yeah, I, I think the glamour and profile, I think we get told that we should build profile, but really we could be a lot more kind of getting stuff done. I agree with that. I think, yeah. I think chasing fame is empty. Yeah. I think if you're getting into this to be famous, I think that's a very short-lived concept. If you're yeah. if you're doing this because you really want to build a successful company and you're passionate about the company that you're building, it's almost like those other that's a byproduct, which is nice for some. But if it's your sole mission, and we've all known those people, we've all worked with those people, yeah. um, it's it's very empty. And place it's not. To be. And what I was saying, and the glamour on all this, and I want to, Sarika down there shaking her head. I'm like, your 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 microphone's yours next. Is is because I had this experience in Vancouver with uh, meeting some entrepreneurs there, and someone I said, you know, one of the women, I said, oh my god, she's fantastic, and they're like, yeah, but she launched two years ago, and she really hasn't done much. And I'm like, excuse my language. I'm like, what the fuck? It's been two years. Rome wasn't built in a day. Instagram wasn't built in two years. We've got this like glamorous notion of the speed and two years and you exit. And I think your, your point on publicity and, and press is, is absolutely right. We can shine a light too soon on people and not let them get the job done. Sarika, on the glamour. Actually, our product is B2C, and I'll say this. It's no more glamorous. Um, and but it's got a really sexy name. It's got a sexy name, rank and style. Um, but um, but day-to-day -day is no more glamorous. And I would say that I actually think there's a slightly different definition. I agree that chasing glamour um, is not is not satisfying um, on a personal level, on a mm -hmm. professional level for me. Um, and I don't think it necessarily leads to a successful business. But I do think what makes what we do so satisfying, and it's my definition of glamour, although it's more sort of guts and glory, um, is the the very close nexus between cause and effect in everything you do. That, to me, is what makes what I do in building a business um, that satisfying um, and I think ultimately leads to actually building a, a successful business is saying everything I do actually has, for better or for worse, a very meaningful effect, um, whether it's a hiring decision, a marketing strategy, um, a brainstorm session on... Um, on how you're going to spend your money, whatever it is, um, there's just so much um, impact that you have in all of your thoughts and your decision making and the time you put into things and the output. And that's my definition, I think, of what makes this glamorous, <laughs> is the role you can play in your outcomes. 
Right. Um, from our email exchange before, I think, Amanda, it was you who talked about the, um, the culture of rejection. Wanna, because that was, I thought that was such, um, such a good way of putting it and how in, in, in this world of startups and everything that you ride, um, just how do you manage that culture of rejection? Um, well, I think that, you know, um, you know, when you, when you work at a big company, you're, you're sort of like, um, your buff, you have a buffer around you. Um, and so even though like you're hearing no, um, it's not as, as quite as um, sort of cutting. It doesn't have um, as much, you know, maybe you missed one promotion, but there might be another one coming up or you don't get a, you know, your idea for the project doesn't get selected. Um, but, um, you know, with, with startups, when <laughs> the no has um, a, a much bigger, it can, or can have a much bigger impact, especially when you're raising money and you get a lot of no's and, um, and just, um, I think, kind of stealing yourself and, like, developing a thick skin for that is um, something that, you know, most people are not born with. Um, so, I, you know, I think that it's definitely something that uh, my co-founder and I have um, kind of learned. Sort of managing deflation on a daily basis. Tariq, I see you nodding your head. Yeah, you yeah. more no's than yeses. Um, and it's more no's than I've ever heard in my life. Generally, people that start companies before this are sort of type A's and have achieved a certain degree of achievement um, and always feel like if they do X, then Y will happen, whether it's getting into college or passing a test and beyond and starting a business is um, very, very different. That being said, I actually think in some ways I'm learning that I um, tend to walk away with uh, more insights from the no's than I do yeses, because um, the dissent actually makes me think about things I've never thought about before um, and the, you know pushing back and, and, and I generally try to take that feedback, um, have my moments of being like, oh, that sucked. Um, and, then kind of going, and then going back and saying like, okay, that's something important to think about. That's a really valid point and I need to. Well, the no's in the beginning are much dif more yeah, difficult. Exactly. It's actually, the further you get along, you get along, you, um, you have perspective. Nuanced. And yes, yeah. and you sort of understand like, oh, right, we aren't a good fit for them. Right. You know, and they aren't a good fit for yeah, us for these reasons. Personally. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. yeah. I think the no's are, okay like the no's are one of the reasons i like being an entrepreneur when i was in other people's companies and my manager didn't like me like that was it and i've had companies that were like that because i'm you know not everyone likes me a lot of people do which is great but not everyone does and when my manager didn't like me that was a very very hard place to be like i had to you know you don't have a lot of room to move but with startups you know if one vc doesn't want to fund us or one you know, developer doesn't want to come work with us, like, there's, you know, hundreds of other VCs, there's hundreds of other Android developers. I really don't care. Like, most of the time, it's fine. Like, I'll just move on. And I didn't have that luxury, you know, in corporations. Um, one of the things about no is it's really not no. I mean, you've heard it before, it's not now. And so I think, for me, it becomes this exciting opportunity to convince people otherwise. And I think time heals all no's. So, you know, if you can... <laughs> Because it's like most it's tweetable at the org event tonight is going to be <laughs> no, but great. I, no, I just mean like a lot of it. Sometimes it's social proof. Sometimes it's traction. Like often it's just a jigsaw puzzle, and you're just putting the pieces in, and you need to go in at the right time. And and it's you know it's very rarely a like no, never contact me again. Right. Don't annoy me. Go away. It's literally convince me more. And I would say no. You know, it's it's a VC world joy might correct me but i feel like it's like dating you know you know if the, if they if they're into you they're into you and if they're not they're not so at the end of the day he's just not into you or she's just not that into you um i take i don't keep hounding someone that has said no to me you know i, ha I had vcs in my first startup say no to my second startup and that's okay and actually the no was for a good reason the product wasn't where it needed to be and we we actually did take their their, uh, the reason for no as a, a, a good piece of information to, to kind of rejigger the product. Um, now, the good thing about that, as you said, is that that no is now a yes. If I go back to that VC, guaranteed they want in today. Um, so I, I don't take a no as a permanent no either, but I would say that I think some entrepreneurs spend a lot of time chasing VCs that have no intention of investing in your company. So you, should, you need to look for those signs. Again, I don't think it's any different than dating. I really do not. If they don't respond to your emails or they don't want updates about your company, 
they do not want to invest in your company. Move on to someone else. But I would also argue that, like, something that we have found is that, um, like, sometimes we're just, like, not, you know, the right fit. Yeah. And somebody says no, but we really like them. And we feel like going, we found that actually going back to that person and they know, like, the, conver- the like, investment conversation is over. And in some ways it's, it, like, takes, you know, all the, like, tension out of the they room. They want to advise you. And anyway. so then yeah. they, they've been, you know, very helpful because yeah. we can be extra candid with them. Right. Um, and so I I actually it can that. be, um, you can build a really effective relationship. And we've that. even had those people then later, like, turn and, and 100%, invest. percent absolutely. Because they've watched the progress, yep. they've, they, you know, they've gotten engaged. I, I yeah. think that for those investors that you know are, uh, you might not be a right fit at that moment, but you keep them apprised of your progress, you yeah. could turn that relationship into something else down the line for yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, actually, um, what, somebody who's been Just super, super... Knows, I emailed the panel before and said I had to moderate two panels, so if they could talk amongst themselves a lot, it would help me out. <laughs> Um, You're doing great, guys. Somebody, uh, so early on when the no's were really hard, I actually cried in a VC's office. Um, and that person has become so helpful to us. Um, because, <laughs> um, okay, I'm remembering that. That's amazing. Yeah. Anyway. Oh um, I had some really great advice from Julia Grace of Tindy Marketplace. It's a marketplace for hardware. She said that, and this is more at the angel stage, it's obviously different for VCs, that a lot of people have already made up their mind if they're going to invest before they even see you. And I think from a female founder perspective, you often are like a massive perfectionist or you go and polish your deck more and you wait until everything's like just right or you get more growth. And that kind of liberated me to just go out there and say, look, like just as you say, some people it's going to be a great fit and they're not going to ask you to collect more rocks from the top of the mountain. So when you find yourself like, hey, I went and fetched this rock and now I'm fetching this one and it's still like go fetch more, it's a sign that it's not really the right fit. Mm-hmm. But I thought that was really great advice. Mm-hmm. But I want to say this is like part of this, I'm going to say non-glamorous reality is that you think about this kind of thing all the time mm-hmm. when you're not thinking about the product, when you're not thinking about the team. And if you hired the right person and um, Kathy, you made a great point about um, in our email exchange on turning off, you know, cause there's oh, too cause many people, do. yeah, oh. cause, it, cause people saying, Oh, you know, I want it for the lifestyle. And you're kind of like, what I mean, I, I don't know. I used to know what that was before I became a founder. Um, I used to, believe it or not, leave my phone at home and go on vacation and never answer email. And those, those days are long gone. This is my second startup. Um, so that's impossible now, obviously. Uh, but when, I do try to uh, – I do have a child, so I do try to not constantly be on my phone in front of her. I do try to uh, segregate that a little bit when I'm with her during the day and at night. Then I do work again another four hours, you know, after 8 o'clock. And that's just kind of the – that's the life of it. But so there is no really turning off because I'm either I'm either working or I'm taking care of her and then I'm working again. And so I think those days are over for me. I, I can't speak for everybody else, but turning off is just not something I can do. I mean, it's really hard. I try. My team's great and super respectful and I, I respect their time on the weekends, too. There are lots, lots the of team, my team's here. My team's here. Yeah. Woo! Oh um, and I, I try not to email them a lot over the weekends either because I really want to respect their time. I think that's important. It's different when you get an email from the CEO on a Saturday. You feel like you have to answer, so I try not to do that. I try to actually send emails. Wait till Sunday wait. morning. Wait till yeah, Sunday wait till morning. Or, <laughs> or wait till Monday morning. Or, you know, if I have a thought, I write it down and I'll email someone later. I do that. I'm very conscious of other people's time who work for me as well. So one, I think we've lost all respect for boundaries in this country. I really do. I think we've absolutely, there are are no lines between your personal life and your private life. I have a major issue with that. I lived in Europe for eight years and, you know, Europeans know how to live. They know how to separate the two. They, They go on vacation. They really go on vacation. Maybe that's changed since I've lived there, but I think we've lost all respect for our personal, personal life and our professional life. And I don't know how that we're ever going to get that back. I just yeah. feel like it's gone. But you know? but when you're the founder of a company, I mean, you're living, breathing, worrying about that, yeah. like, 24-7. Right. So you can hear you, see you nodding. Right. Yeah. See you nodding down there. Um, yeah, I would say there are no boundaries um, left in general. And then I think in particular, if you have your own company, I'll say this. I think it's really important knowing that there's no boundaries, actively trying to carve out either an activity or some chunk of time that is sacred every day based on your own personal priorities and preferences, and that will mean different things for everyone. Um, just because I think knowing that you're allocating that time and you're and you're doing it and it's a commitment to that sort of um, sacred time, I think just mentally means a lot and it feels like you're doing something for 
yourself and the effects of that are felt way beyond that hour or two. And for me, that's um, that's always been just working out and going to the gym. It could be something for it could be different things for everybody, but keeping that constant, I think, is really um, important because the life of an entrepreneur is this, and it's it's a roller coaster. Um, the highs are really high, the lows are really low, and so I think just having one thing that you know you can always go back to, and that's the thing that you can guarantee will help you deal with stress, um, will be an escape, will be a source of satisfaction. It's just guaranteed to make you feel better, I think is really important to find. Um, we we actually installed Streak or Boomerang and, and now we schedule, if you want to work on the weekend, just schedule them for Monday because I completely agree. I've been doing a startup now for around three and a half years full time and you can get incredibly burnt out. Mm -hmm. And once that happens, you become so unproductive. And so I find that at least having one day off and like scheduling time off or scheduling time for relaxation or focus work makes everything so much better. So I definitely would recommend, especially if you're thinking about not only the life of the founder, but the life of your team, we have a freelancer marketplace. So we want them to live healthy, rounded lives. So we don't email them on weekends. And that's just part of our culture deck. And once you actually start leading with cultural values, you can attract so many great people. And one of our advisors is Joel Gascoigne from Buffer. And they get thousands and thousands of resumes every time they put a job out because they have a really great culture. Do we sometimes confuse that the culture with, I want to say, um, I want to say expectations on, on with respect to work or delivery or lifestyle? And I think, you know, in terms of people confusing these things. Or confusing passion with working 24 hours a day. I mean, you can't be passionate 24 hours a day. Everybody needs time to <laughs> recharge, right? right? Mm -hmm. So I think I have a tremendous amount of stamina, especially for my age. But, well, we can talk um, about that, sister. You know, um, <laughs> I don't know if that's on the list, but anyways, um, yes, I'm over 40. And I, I do need my time to recharge my batteries and to think about other things that I love, like interior design, other things that have nothing to do with technology. I mean, I just need, I need to, to replenish myself like everyone else. So I think, I think that's really important. I think we've kind of lost sight of it. I mean, passion doesn't mean you work 24 hours a day until 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. It's just, and it's not sustainable. It's absolutely not sustainable, unless you're 20. So those of you that are 20, maybe, but on my team. <laughs> Sarika, you're leaning well, forward. Actually, I have a question for the panelists, because something that I personally, I think, um, often deal with is, um, even though you know it's not a good idea to work all the time, there's this sort of almost like guilt when you're not working, because right. everything you do can technically move the needle on your business. Like one extra hour could mean you'll um, accomplish one more thing, you'll get one more meeting and one more person will know about you. And so I just wondered how, um, while I know that the rational part of me is like actually shutting off is gonna make me um, a better partner tomorrow and more thoughtful, um, there's still a part of me that's like goes back to my like grad school days of like, oh, maybe if I just like do a little bit more work, this will lead to better output. And just wondered how you guys all kind of manage that guilt. Especially when you have investors and you feel like you're, you know, you have obligations to them, to your team and mm -hmm. others. I just think you're never done. That's the, the how I manage it. I think uh, you're, the goalpost is always moving. Right. So we hit 10 million last year. We're trying to hit 20 this year. So I have to hit 20 now. I don't think about 10 anymore. It's gone. I did it. It's over. So the hard part is you, you're constantly chasing something else, and because you're never done then it's almost like you're never satisfied, even though we should be thrilled that we hit $10 million and we're on track to do 20. Um, so I think I just, I'd, I'd really try not to feel guilty because there's always something else to achieve and you're gonna drive yourself crazy. Yeah, 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 because it's, there's always a new goalpost and it's always being moved. Yeah. So what VCs do, no offense, Joy, but you know, yeah, you hit 10, now you're gonna be 30 or, you know, there's, there's never a satisfaction, right. even with your board. You know, great job anyway, so now you can do 30 this year. You know, that's, yeah. it's it's always moving. It's a moving thing. And there's always someone else who's doing better. Right, but right. I feel like, yeah. you know, um, it's sort of easy to get weighed down by it, but also, like, I think that, like, when I'm feeling low about it, I'm like, well, you know, I get to run a company and, like, create something from scratch. And you know what I mean? Like, I sort of, I think that, like, just, like, stepping back and realizing that, like, you actually have the choice to do these things um, and to work this intensely and be this excited about what you're doing. Um, and 
like 98% of the population doesn't. Um, so like it's hard to be like too like wow 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 about it. But um, but I will tell a story, which is that so I have two kids, um, and they're twins, and they're seven now. Um, and the first thing that my daughter made with Legos was a laptop so that she could be like mommy. Yes. Um, yes. And <laughs> first I was like ooh, you know like <laughs> that's bad. But then I was like you know what it's not like she sees me doing something that I'm really passionate about about um, and and that I'm excited about and I want like her to like have an interesting career and so like you know that's you know that's that's the life of a founder yeah. and we started doing so we do daily stand-up but now we do the daily gratitude session at the end of the day so this all comes down to feeling grateful and obviously there's so much around like how happiness is dependent on gratitude and joy and everyone should go watch Brene Brown like TED Talks of Oprah for hours um, but that makes such a big difference because if you don't celebrate your daily wins you just forget it's a massive marathon like we say it's go 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 so every every day if you can even just celebrate some sort of um, something that you're grateful for like mine might be oh I got to go walk around like Prospect Park in the sun so it doesn't necessarily have to be huge wins just just little things and that makes a massive difference I think for mental health I agree with that I think it's really easy as a founder to forget because you are you're, there's so much on your plate it's really easy to forget the wins or to overlook them real quickly and move on because you're trying to do something else and so we don't we don't I, lo I love that we don't do the gratitude. We do take a moment. We won like a kind of a massive award, which I won't say because my VP of marketing will kill me um, when well, it comes out. Congratulations for winning awesome. that that we haven't and, uh, about. Yeah, it's yes. awesome. It's coming out in August. But, you know, just taking a moment with the team to say this is great. Can we just take one moment before we move on to all the other stuff we have to do? You know. Alyssa, I see yeah. you leaning forward. Well, I, I think that's right that having some like zen mental Stability, no matter what's going on, is really important. I was really struck by a Twitter post recently by the founder of Stripe. Uh, and Stripe is a very successful payments company backed by YC and now like Andreessen Horowitz. And they're like all over the world. They're wonderful. Uh, and the founder said there is always something wrong, right? Like with your startup, there's always something wrong. And if you look at the really successful big companies, uh, who haven't exited yet, you've got like Uber and Airbnb and like, oh my God, is there a lot wrong? And I think about that with Glimpse, like there is relatively little wrong with my company, but like there's always something that I'm thinking about or like trying to make happen and like wins happen, great things happen and I'm excited and I'm happy, but you know, okay, so I did that and it worked and it's done. Now let me focus on the thing that needs my attention, which is the problem. So it's really easy to spend a lot of emotional energy thinking about the things that need solving. Uh, and it helps me a lot to take a step back and know that like the founders at Uber and the founders at Airbnb and the founders at Stripe and the founders of a lot of other companies whose dirty laundry is less public, like they're also, it's really, really hard. You know, like even when things are going really well, you still have these things that are really like challenging. Um, and like, I wouldn't want to do anything else. The challenges are really fun and cool and you solve them and it's awesome. But I think there's this like mental mindset that you either have as a founder you need to develop where like you, you compartmentalize, you know, and you like just manage to feel okay and be optimistic despite the fact that like you're lift and you just tried to come to New York and like, you know, the that taxi. Out, so yeah, and, no. and they still had their launch party, right? So like. <laughs> I, I think, like, here in New York, they still throw a big party. Like, what? Wait, we can't launch, but we'll have a launch party. That's compartmentalization. <laughs> That's outstanding. I always, I always just sort of say it, too, you know, with the startup um, world. It's like, you got to have surfer legs. You know, you got to be able to ride the, the good ones and the crap ones and have that, that stamina. Um, Sarika, thoughts? No, no, I was just agreeing. You're just agreeing, agreeing <laughs> on that? I'm agreeing on that? Um, well, because I don't want to hear myself. And I'm sure there's people who have questions. I have no blog-loving bags to give, though. <laughs> see, you know what? Maybe, maybe it'll see. I owe you. I for have a stickers. Blog. Oh, we got stickers. Okay, you can have a glimpse sticker. <laughs> questions for this panel. Okay, and I've got a little thing. People who know me, you got to say who you are, where you're working, because you might be at a startup. There may be someone in the room who can help you. This is the best networking for everyone who doesn't like to have net networking. So. In the front row, we have 
Brian, I'm with Paul Green. We're working on uh, animation of kids' stories, specifically from Africa. Um, my question is, how hard do you work your co-founders if you have it? So, well, that's why Kate's allowed to be here because she's got her co-founder working. No. <laughs> Pax isn't allowed to leave the house. He he can't leave the house. Yeah, we all agree. New Jersey and, and he code. agreed. I agree. He doesn't leave the house. Okay. So no, you want to you want a serious you want a serious answer on this? How, you've no, all, no, all got I co-founders. Mean, <laughs> all got co all all have co-founders. All like, did you have like a co-founder agreement? Is yeah. there like the equivalent yeah. of like you know the prenup? We have, we, I have two co-founders that are here. I think. Where's the co-founders? Where's the, yeah, there they are. Woohoo! Probably answer how hard I work them. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think I think everybody has. Um, we all expect a lot of each other. I think everybody has a very different sort of style and approach. And I think what we are always sort of working on and getting hopefully getting better at is um, appreciating that everybody's working as hard as the other and just but everybody has different styles and mm -hmm. approaches and that's not necessarily about counting hours or time online or you know time in the office and it can look like very different things for everyone and everybody brings very different contributions but um, I think it's really important to have really high standards and very high expectations of the people that you choose to, to partner with I think mm -hmm. that you know nothing should compromise that no. Kate did you have a thought um, yeah, so we very much like divide and conquer with tasks, and I'm more of an introvert, even though it probably doesn't seem like on the panel, and, and Shell is more extroverted. not allowed to be one if you're Australian. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I actually sometimes like, like um, you know, working from home, getting through so much uh, different things. Shayla likes really busy work, so it's, it's almost if we were a car, she's kind of like the engine being really responsive to a lot of stuff, and I'm the one steering us in the, the direction that we need to go at. I actually work, she is so, such a hard worker that I tell her to work less. So it's not necessarily about working harder, it's like stop working, like have a break, like think about everything because we're, you know, the en the engine might be on fire one day and I'm like, oh no, like quick. So um, I think uh, it's, and definitely divide and conquer, like you don't both need to make decisions on everything or go to every meeting and, and things like that. Yeah, I would say, uh, sorry, and just on that point, I think it's really, uh, helpful when you do divide and conquer because um, everybody brings a different talent to the mm -hmm. table and it's so much more um, efficient in getting things done but actually effective in getting things done if everybody knows their strengths and you become aware of them and you sort of divide according to, mm -hmm. to those. I agree with that too. Um, my co-founder and I did that about 18 months ago and um, it just like it changed everything. Yeah. Also because like the things that I'm not indirectly involved in all the time I kind of I think I bring fresh perspective too and she does the same with the things mm -hmm. that I like the teams that report to me so like when I like update her she'll like ask questions that I didn't think to ask um so I, I think it's a it's a really um I mean it's also just a total necessity yeah mm -hmm. it's not it's not possible to actually overlap them yeah because right. that dolly the sheep clone thing never worked out the way I was hoping it would um more questions that's when I get to show my my age who remembers dolly the sheep come on <laughs> I was, you know, as an attorney, I was really hopeful on that one. And then this Kelly could have had a life. Anyway, question, second row. So the question is, um, two questions. The first is, who do you think were the most important people when you were first starting out and you heard a lot of those no's? Like, who were really helping you and were your closest support network? And then the second piece is, as you're first starting out and um, thinking about your co-founders and skill sets you need to fill in, how did you go about meeting and Really cementing those co-founding relationships. Great questions. Oh, and I'm sitting down. Can you repeat the question? Okay, there we go. Can you feel the questions, please? It, it, uh, uh, I'll take it then. Um, I've been actually really fortunate. Kelly Howie was here. Uh, was one of the first people who was really helpful uh, with this company. Um, with co-founding, I've tried to force. A number of co-founder relationships in the past, I found at a lot of companies, and uh, until Glimpse, those companies really didn't work out because the co-founders, my co-founders weren't on the same page with me, which speaks to what we were saying before, where just their commitment level was really different, uh, and we hadn't known each other very long. Uh, and I don't regret having built those companies with those people because it got me here, but you know, with my company now, we knew that we wanted to work together. We knew we were on the same page. It was like the most natural thing in the world. 
um, that we would work together. Uh, and that's been a very stable relationship. We've been building together for the last year and a half with like very, very smooth and like always on the same page, which is remarkable. Uh, so I think with co-founder relationships, if I were going to you know, try and do this again, it, it's awkward to say this, but it's, it's really good if it's someone you've known for a while so you have some trust. Um, the relationships where I like went out and tried to find a co-founder and then we just started a company together, like it's like getting married. It's like a really intense thing to do with someone you just met. Um, yeah. 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 And in terms of like, uh, I'm thinking, Kate, you know, you and you and Shayla was yeah. like a real meeting of the minds. Yeah. yeah, we we became like accountability partners basically for the last year. Like it, it's almost like peer to peer mentoring, but we would go for walks around Central Park and just kind of talk about I was coming into it from my previous company where I was a solo founder and that was like a horrible experience. And I think it's definitely great to find a co-founder. Um, and we would just go and she would be on the investment side. And then over a year, we basically built up that relationship. And then when the timing was right, it was like, let's do this. And we founded the company only in January this year. I think sometimes we look for extremely opposite skill sets or if you're less technical, it's like, oh, I need a technical co-founder. But the thing is, it's not like I, I can find so many technical people, but it's like unless it's a great relationship, it's not going to work for the long term. So we actually, Shayla's more sales and ops. I'm more product marketing content. And now we've got a CTO who's coming on board that I've known for five years in Australia. So it, it kind of, instead of going, oh, I need a technical co-founder, I need this person, you can get the that all to come together once you've got the right foundation. So when we first started as well, we had a checklist of like super hard questions, like pretty much drilled each other on what would happen if this happened or would you do this and that. And I had a, a co-founder relationship that didn't work out around um, a year ago now. And I just, I think I was petrified of hard conversations with that person and I never really spoke my mind and now Shayla and I can basically say an ink to each other and know that we've got a really great foundation. Yeah. What about the relationships in terms of when you need help at the beginning? I was a founder who wrote, wrote a piece in CNN on this and I'm just thinking, you know, dealing with that culture of rejection and the no's and how you, you know, like who do you turn to and what do you look for and, and who do you want to kind of surround yourself with when you start on this crazy journey and the startup founder who wrote the piece in CNN was basically like, no one was around when things weren't going really well. And now that things are going better, I've got so many friends, <laughs> you know, um, but you know, is there relationships or things you think about that, you know, I want to say the the navigating the nose at the, and the, and the other things at the beginning. I don't think it's just the beginning. I mean, I think it's something that you do ongoing. I feel like I'm constantly developing lots of different relationships. Um, you know, with other founders, with investors, with, you know, people with specific, you know, expertise. And, you know, there's no like, there's no like silver bullet person who can solve, you know, who can like kind of comfort you with <laughs> all of the um, issues, but also like know everything that you, you have questions about. So I actually think that like there's, there really isn't like, you know, some, you know, supreme mentor out mm -hmm. there it's um, it's a matter <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know it's just like developing people who you, you trust and and often like you know founders who have more experience with, than you um mm -hmm. are incredibly helpful if you know if you can um you know i can't tell you the number i mean number of cakes that i've baked uh, we actually have an almond cake recipe that we call the thank you cake um because i've you know i literally baked hundreds of them as thank that yous. beats a thank written hand, handwritten thank you note yeah. get an almond beats cake <laughs> well you know you really need help in the beginning. So yeah. it's like we were truly grateful and it was worth it. That's, that's going to be a motivation for people to be really helpful to you now. They're going to want the almond cake. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the help is a lot easier to get when you're struggling. Like when, you know, it was two or three years ago for me and I had more time because there was less happening at my company. You know, it was more social. I was going to hacker spaces and meetups. And it was easier to talk about what was going on in my world because it was more relatable for the people around me. Like on a good day now, it's like, oh, the BBC cold called me and I, you know, we got this investment. Like no one wants to hear that. But, you know, when I was struggling, it's that's easy to share with people. You know, and you're still like building community. Well, we can, the rest of us can feel better about ourselves because it doesn't suck as much as your bad news at that point. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think actually when you're struggling, um, 
you know, people people want to be around for that. Um, they're they're not I can feel so much better about my life. Yeah, they yep. don't necessarily like want to help you. They're not gonna like send an introduction. They're not gonna write you a check. They're not gonna help your Kickstarter, but they will totally buy you a beer and hold your hand. Um, it, it's you know later. <laughs> the other. All right, let's take one more question. Difference between a co-founder yeah, and a leader. I, I think definitely. Like a, you could have an amazing co-founder for the first year or two, and then like both of you could be great co-founders in the early stages. But then as you start to build the team more, you could be really poor leaders or just not natural leaders. It can be taught. You often see a few CEOs like go out of being the CEO role and they go to like business school and then they're back for two. You know, you're like okay, they've got the training wheels off. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there is a definite difference. Um, and I think that you can be a leader early on, like for the Fetch, for instance, we created a, a volunteer network of 140 people. And that's based on basically leadership because they can see that vision and what, where you're taking it. So I think, um, yeah, it's about how you inspire people, how you are to others and everything. And that's not all co-founders. Mm -hmm. I also feel like people are leaders in different areas. Like my co-founder and I kind of like, I think she's a better leader in, in some areas and I, you know, I am in others. And so we kind of split it up. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you, ladies, thank you. as always. <laughs>